Mad Language Broadcasting by Adam Corres from the anthology Writers in Lockdown, read by Rosie Turner. Cobb, you're a plum. Sorry, what was that, Thomas? A total absolute stoneless. Come and look at this. Cobb sighed and rose from the sofa as his flatmate basked in the radiant glow of a laptop, where he was usually to be found when he wasn't being dragged against his will into the harsh daylight of Swansea campus. You told me, right, that the angelic Blin. I think you settled on the unutterably foxy, body and soul-wrenching Bryn, Cobb corrected. She seems fairly normal to me. Doesn't matter. The point I'm trying to get across to beat into your adult brain substance is that you said it would put me in Bryn's good books if I recommended that translation job. Which she got, added Cobb. She needed paying work and you got it for her. Well done. Thomas nutted his forehead into the keyboard with mid-range force, carefully calculated to cause no real damage. Right, yes, which she did get. Obviously, you prat, because she's the only Gaelic Airs translation student at the university. But look here, duckwit. I don't know what your problem is. She's a very organised person, so if you set her off in the right direction, she does it all by herself. I have no idea why she wanted to work with me in her group project, but I'm not complaining. Cobb added, picking his way around the clutter of the flat rather than doing anything about it. Did she get a really good grip on your wrist and pull? asked Thomas. She did that, yes. I got the feeling she only came to Swansea University because she sprained all the available wrists in her village. The screen was bright and its appearance hardly forbidding, so Cobb began to suspect that Thomas's problem could be somehow connected to some of the words written on it. Monthly broadcast viewing figures from the British Audience Research Board ran the header. Cobb focused down to try and make sense of the problem, as a seething Thomas prodded his most helpful finger at the passage, which currently troubled him. Brush up your ears, BBC Alba. Scottish Gaelic translation, digital, free-to-air television. Descriptor, minor regional languages. Category, public information. Format, 30-minute broadcast production. Slot, late night. Viewing figures, zero. Zero, Cobb. Bloody zero. Last month there were more people sat on screen than watching the programme. So? What do you mean, so? What is this so of which you speak? She's going to lose her job and hate me for wasting her time. You're a pillock, Cobb. Thomas shook the dust out of his hair as his thoughts turned to the ever-present allure of instant noodles. It doesn't matter, Thomas. They get paid anyway. It was more or less at this point that Thomas realised it's no fun being the only person on the planet who has any common sense. He nodded into the keyboard once more, this time making enough of a dent to disconnect the internet. Look, mate, said Cobb, brightening up the lives of those around him. Minor language programming is all supported by grants. Some of the funding comes from the cultural board, some from the diversity council, some from the regional governments, and the rest from the national broadcaster. They are obliged to support minority culture or it will expire and they'll be the ones who face the blame. In Parliament, see where their money comes from. They can't be found to starve one culture or mother tongue at the expense of another, so it doesn't matter a job that no one's watching. It's only important that the programmes are made available. With an expression that said that there were a couple of dozen questions he would like to ask, but he couldn't think of them right now. Thomas digested this fresh information and stood a while in thought. He knew that some things took on new meaning with hindsight. For example, he had always been exceptionally good at camouflage as a small boy, when his parents would play a game where he'd win a special medal if they didn't see him all day. Thomas began to see that this might be another perfectly normal, paranormal phenomenon. He also knew in his heart that any obvious example of Byzantine stupidity didn't mean it wasn't also reality. Bugger, he concluded, dispensing with the philosophical metaphysics. What's the problem? You still get to sniff around Bryn, so why is that face hanging off you? You look dour as a pile of ironing. I know what this is. It's hereditary, isn't it? Just like that documentary, Akhenaten and the 18th Dynasty. You've got an 18th Dynasty face, and you think that's going to put her off. Come on, cheer up and have an almond Danish. Thomas shifted uneasily, like a newly informed lottery winner, queuing up without the ticket. My grandfather, C spoke a Celtic tongue, which he wanted to teach me, but I wasn't interested at the time. He died, the last native speaker, standing on one leg, putting his socks on at the top of the stairs. That's a common cause of death in my family. 
Sometimes it's tights, sometimes it's the beekeeping outfit, or socks is the most common. But always, invariably, we die changing clothes at the top of the stairs. Anyway, he went into the great oot without even explaining the language. Once he told me he wanted to pass on a great treasure. Then he said what it was in his daft language, so I never did find anything. Digging dirty holes all over the garden. It was our cultural heritage, and now we've lost it. We, is it? Cobb chided. Thomas Thomas appropriates for himself a sense of ethnic belonging. You'll be making nutty coracles next. Well, I don't think it was important at the time. There's no point in speaking a language that nobody else knows because they'll ask you what it means in English. And when you answer in English, that cuts out the middle man. I couldn't have guessed there'd be any genuine money in it. Why are you making that unusual face? It's disconcerting. I was thinking, what if it hasn't gone? Cobb speculated. It wouldn't be much use, us digging him up, replied Thomas. No, what I mean is, who apart from us would know that the language is dead, that it wasn't passed along? Cobb ventured. It would be your word against theirs, about your own private conversations with your grandfather, right? Thomas considered this entirely radical possibility. So what you're saying is, we could make it all up for a laugh. Well? The bus began to draw away leaving Thomas alone on the curb. The sound of a press-button bell stabbed insistently until the bus stopped again a few yards up to a Jack Cobb, who was finishing an unhurried crisp packet. The pair walked over the path towards a private car park, which had a van in it marked security, but both could see they were blocked by flowerbed landscaping. Thomas stopped, but Cobb sprung straight over the flowerbed, leaving footprints in the loose soil. Thomas looked up to check no one was watching and picked a tentative path across, at which point Cobb inflated his empty crisp packet and banged it loud against his hand. After a brief circumnavigation to find the front entrance of an imposing office building, they found a sign showing this to be the headquarters of a television channel. In the flourishing adventure of life, many things run smoothly, but few flow as smooth as the ink when you're signing your own death warrant. In this case, the document was a contract with S4C to provide content for the Welsh regional channel. The 2am slot was something they'd been struggling to fill for years, and this proposal presumably appealed to the broadcaster as heaven-sent diversification. The fact the language was incomprehensible authenticated why so few people spoke it, proving impractical to prepare a contract in Wangli dialect, which no lawyer could attest to. S4C provided one in Welsh and English, crossing their corporate digits that no offence would be taken. The first broadcaster tuned to Thomas and Cobb's unspoken plans and they'd invented a new letter. Wengley was ready. Bleth plithi rotwin ko na korog dopa rub. Karatuyap tebewin ink nam puti plos dangwel karako. How pud we plag we lan maft rop. Lef mat rop, lef mat na na left plom. Prove to me that isn't a legitimate language. Thomas channelled Cobb privately after the on-screen display, keying a digital pin into the S4C back office site to check viewing figures. Cobb grabbed his shoulders and craned over, their eyes widening in triumph. Two! Two stupid viewers! Probably drunk, and that's 550 squids in our back pocket! Less tax, Thomas, and insurance contributions, being conditioned by the circulation of money, is the same bad joke everyone falls for. We're on easy street if we can keep this rubbish going. Look, once upon a time a Greek fellow tugged on the end of a chain. Here we go. And on that was a great big anchor and caught up on it was an enormous sucker and stuck to the sucker was the planet Earth and when the bloke pulled, the whole planet landed on his head and the moral of the story is, don't mess with the system. I'm just being cautious, Cobb worried. OK, let's look at the basics. The trouble with talking like an elf is no one in our neck of the woods does it. Sweet the rain's new fall, mine is the starlight, gently unwinds the florid sun down to its lover, the sea. See? See, it doesn't roll well to the Silurian ear, which is adapted to a more chip-based dialogue. Not some Mediterranean ninny with leaves growing out of his head, or Klingon, Thomas pondered. You're saying our language shouldn't be sung or barked, but should sound practical. Yes, now you're getting the hang of it. Plos dangwel karakoch. Keep it sensible. Exactly. 
I can't describe it, but there's still a sense of discord to what you're doing. It sounds to me like a bit of a duck call for fantasy kingdoms. Unbeknownst to the lads, the president of the National University of Wales Student Union was even now circulating a wingly link to her followers to proclaim the green shoots of regional insurgency. The Handback Stonehenge campaign could wait. She was angsty, tipsy and unashamedly nationalistic. Ragonwy Val plus Dandwell Crotch, she signed it and none of 1,600 recipients could bring themselves to disagree with that sentiment. From the third or fourth broadcast, the viewing figures climbed steadily as students, at first in Wales and then wider, made Thomas and Cobb's show required viewing. In bedrooms and sitting rooms, perched on the stairs, with phones at parties and going home on late night buses, eyes followed their every mewling, keening a sentence with bemusement, all the time nurturing the belief that they had found something wonderfully weird on the planet that was known only to them. It wasn't more than a fortnight later when all seemed to be going so well that S4C forwarded a bundle of homework. Cobb, there's a petition here. What does it say? How should I know? It's written in our daft language. Rodwi plat bla tiflin. The postcard's asking what mohi but means. You can answer that because I'm pretty sure you bloody said it. This letter says they remember the dialect from when they were children. Cobb joined the read-through session as Thomas handed over another, rather serious, four-page letter. The gravity of their guilt took shape. This pedantic sod is some kind of linguistic code-breaker who's listed all these nouns and adjectives, calculated waypoints of our sentences and hopes we don't mind, but has appended 47 grammatical questions. He wants a lexicon and primer. What are we going to do, Cobb? Well, it's hard to say. A bit like Lipton Woodrich. It's a time like this that I always ask myself, what would Dracula have done? That's so helpful. But whatever you're thinking, two wrongs don't make a right. Mm, you're spot on there. Let's make it the best out of three. Sometime later. I've got to the bottom of why we can't get hold of Bryn. Why's that? It's Graham's number. According to the rule book of eternal verities, opportunity knocks and doors open. Others closing, unseen as the whale shark of time soars past, to mix abstract metaphors. On this particularly challenging Wednesday, the door of the collaborator's flat swung open for a certain Bryn, a slight young woman with an unserving ability to look through people as if thoughts were as visible as a wardrobe. Combined with the slender legs of exactly the type that caused so much distress in the oil-rich nations, the effect was unnerving to young men. Cobb wondered how long she'd been outside, and whether she'd heard them practising idiocy. Ah, great, the... It's Bryn, said Thomas, unable to reach the door before Cobb had offered to relieve her of her sun-bleached netball anorak. Netball was an alien world to Cobb, but he'd been to a basketball match once and sat close to the action, which sounded like stamping on a row of finches. He calls you the Bryn, advised Cobb in magnanimous fashion, to wave aside any suggestion that there might be others. Oh, great, you brought the snacks. Bryn, nonplussing her way into the flat and lacking any factual way to put her finger on a problem that surely must be there, unpacked her hall. Her eyes were adjusting to the decade-old light in this place and the room beyond, which Thomas noticed. Ah, right, I expect that's the look you want for your kitchen. Close, replied Bryn. That's the look I want for everybody else's kitchen, to make my own kitchen look fucking spectacular. He, I said takeaway, and you bought cakes. Cakes aren't fast food. Thomas wasn't going to be part of Cobb's insurrection. They can be. M meringue? Scone? See? That's playing with language. A good sign, considering. Cobb responded. How much do I owe you? I'm sorry, Bryn. My flatmate cares very deeply about his greasy kebabs, interjected Thomas. Well, of course, said Cobb. I'm not the kind of guy who will lunge into a takeaway and grab just anything. Did you steal these pub glasses? They're not very clean, Bryn asked them picking up on lurid details around her. We paid for the drinks. No one said the glasses weren't included. Cobb prayed she would never want to meet at their local pub, remembering the discreet safety signs such as the one hanging in the gents' urinals. The tiles here are very slippery, so please be careful when you are pissing on the floor. Thomas drew Cobb's attention to some ice cream wafer clinging to the upper slopes of his pocket, which Cobb collected and dissolved in brief meditation. Appropriating this moment of silence... Thomas got to the point. 
what we'd like you to do, Bryn, is advise us on improving our uh, podcast, if you wouldn't mind seeing some footage. The premise is that my grandfather was the last native speaker of the old Celtic Wengli dialect, and he taught it to me before he passed away, and I've been recording it so the language doesn't die the death. Bryn took a seat and Thomas pressed play on the keyboard. The image was of a functional table and chairs, which Thomas and Cobb merrily invested. A bog roll facsimile of a quaint countryside signpost was placed on the table between them. Without any introduction in English, they shifted directly into conversation in a sylph-hike tongue with an occasional hark back to ragged growling, accumulating in a syncopated effect unknown to civilised ears. Thomas randomly pointed and appeared to inquire, Kolagari soinadi most. Saramost quigli begdri, spirpon bedwi, totslu, replied Cobb, signalling in an adjusted direction. Kobobla gigdam, acknowledged Thomas with a thankful wave. Bobla gigdam to the e, appeared to end the exchange on screen, as the film was paused and Thomas turned to Bryn for approval. Bullshit, she said, sitting back. That isn't a Celtic language. Cobb bridled, biting hula hoops off his fingers didn't seem the same now. There were only about four in a packet. The boys exchanged glances and sensed they had to let her in on it. Quite right, admitted Thomas. Cobb made it up. Hey, and now it's a bit of a cult with numbers growing daily. You did a podcast of this tosh, Bryn inquired, with the same incredulous eyebrows as those of a coroner known to the Thomas family. Not a podcast, not as such, more of a full national broadcast, but it's all fine because we have the 2am slot on Digital S4C Wales and nobody's watching. Bryn appraised Thomas with the cold, inquiring eyes of a coroner, called out to the bottom of the Thomas's family staircase again. Your hairstyle looks even better when you see the back of it. Silence. Oh no, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it like that. Elaborating would be a waste of effort, Thomas realised, as there were only so many black eyes one could scoop up. What I want to know is, how would we make it authentic, as far as we possibly can? What does a language look like as bare bones system? We can pay you as our confidential consultant. In real money, not in kebabs or bourbon biscuits, Bryn asserted to a barrage of nodding. And we need a pamphlet, something we can post back to people who send in questions. All right, confirmed Bryn. 500 in real money, and I'm not putting my name on it. Pleasure doing business with you. Within weeks, things were back on track for Cobb and Thomas. The boys were developing easy-handed confidence, applying subtle humour, sometimes hamming it up, and inventing even more improbable set places to talk gibberish from. The classic episode where one of them dressed up as a cosmonaut and conversed with blob life on Mars threatened to go viral, then really did when a fan replayed it on the big screen at the World Science Convention in Tokyo. The viewing figures became dangerously robust, sometimes assembling an audience which outspaced long-standing cheap daytime programming like Tat in the Attic, venerable cafe crustaceans, packed lunches for train journeys, famous cakes and their consequences, and BBC Manchester's evergreen Lenny's wallpapering nightmares. Questions trickled in by letter and email, in answer to which Bryn's rather smart pamphlets were dispatched. Thomas regretted postage outlay, content instead to email a file without ever asking to see the paper version. A summer passed in creative bliss until the letters turned tricky. Thomas? Yes, Cobb, give me a moment, won't you? I'm scribbling down an idea, and we're dangerously low on custard creams. Thomas, you really should read this. People are trying to learn Wengli and claiming that what we say on screen doesn't match the printed matter we're sending out to them. Tell them we're wrong and proud, like a vlogger's haircut. Seriously? Bung us a pamphlet, then, said Thomas which Cobb obligingly slung at him. Thomas caught it awkwardly and stared disbelieving at the chunky wedge of paper now weighing on his fingers. This isn't a pamphlet, it's a bloody novella. There must be 50,000 words in this. He flicked through. Oh no, not good, not good at all. She's done her job too well. She's codified the language, created a translated vocabulary of eight, nine hundred, a thousand words. There's grammar structure, everything. Forbga Frosty! Is that a swear word? asked Cobb. It will be one day if I mention it enough. Do you know what all this means? A unique problem? Yes. Now we're going to have to learn Bryn's damned bloody language.
As a pair of typical students, Cobb and Thomas weren't used to learning, except in the early morning before an examination, in which circumstance they soaked up knowledge and tea in equal proportion with an intensity that would have spun the owlish head of Minerva. How's progress? asked Bryn when she dropped in to see them. Hot as Einstein's chalk, actually. Pull up a tripod. I'd rather not, replied Bryn. There's something biologically stuck to it. She pulled up a sofa instead, walking it across the carpet in three minutes of grating effort. You really should vacuum under your shitty furniture. They learned and Bryn coached. They learned stuff like this. One, it's really easy to remember new words if you associate something utterly absurd with them. It has to be surreal or exaggerated because human memory filters out boring things as unimportant and conversely latches onto unique images. For example, the Wengli word for happiness is listed as ak glamwich. If you picture in your head for 20 seconds something like a bite of a giant clamshell between two slices of bread, spitting teeth and rejoicing like all of their happy dreams have come true, the meaning of the word will be stuck in your mind forever. 2. Memories like a storage room with the lights gone out. When a torch picks out one object slash memory, it also illuminates the memories connected around it. If you recall one node memory, you get back the whole batch. Bryn's eyelids dropped and something fizzed through the ether. A completely black space had cut itself out of Bryn's unconscious mind, leaving a lighter image of herself standing in it. These two really are the greatest challenge of my life, the phantasm informed us. 3. It is easier to remember information lyrically, like a song where the pattern reminds you of the order in which words appear next. The boys were flagging a little, and Bryn sensed she needed to get through that little urge to dropkick these two hopeless clumps into the sun. 4. Most languages have male and female words, which sounds like a hardship, but if the noun is feminine, the ending should be feminine to agree with it. In Wengli, feminine endings were all a, except when using the female adjectives, massens or breet chosen by Bryn, as opposed to the common male variation t, as in divat. The universe fizzed and adjusted beyond consciousness again, but this time only Cobb occupied the plane of darkness. Life is weird, he informed us. Did you know gnats are just a millimetre long? Live six weeks, go through four larval stages, grow six heads, and when they get too big, they change their bottoms for new ones. I'm sorry, my web search went very badly wrong. Five. When you have an adjective and a noun together, like a busy bee in English, in Wengli the words are said the other way round. When asking a question, is the bee busy? That is done in a higher tone of voice, so information is carried using more bandwidth on the intonation scale. After four hours, Bryn soon looked like she'd had a bit too much of it, whatever it was, but wasn't one to get distraught. 6. There are always exceptions to language rules, which is a handy excuse when you get it wrong and you can pronounce a dead language any way you like, because who's to say? Brilliant, responded Thomas. 7. Female plurals add an S, whereas male plurals often tail away with an ogl. Another neat black square pierced the subconscious dimension, this time featuring only the ethereal form of a startled Thomas. Wow, so this is where I keep my emotional intelligence. His face turned around the void space in wonder. There's certainly a lot of room. Thomas winked out of existence and Bryn slotted into the black realm, claiming it and talking as if directly to camera. Sometimes, talented linguistic students, charmed and impressed by all hours you're putting in to learn their prototype language, just want you to ask them out. A solitary young lady who's combed her hair and gone without biscuits to stay in shape since Freshers Week shouldn't have to sit next to you, on your bed and nuzzle. Honestly, Thomas, pull your finger out and send your mate off for a long walk. The learning session had reached a natural conclusion, so Cobb and Thomas were leaving. Cobb was first out, but Thomas was slower, thanking Bryn. Do you want to hang around for another mug of tea? she inquired of him. I really shouldn't, Thomas answered. Too much caffeine does terrible things to my insides. Thomas turned to pass Bryn's door and completed two full steps before a ladylike hand extended through the gap took a firm grip of Thomas's wrist and pulled hard, lurching him clean off his feet and back inside. At around a smidge after ten o'clock, Thomas, looking flushed and dazed, found himself returning home. Cobb happened to meet him at the front door, holding a letter. You took your time? Oh, hello, Cobb. I learned so much today, it's incredible. You did, didn't you? 
I learned something more. If you pull the wool over the regional TV channel's eyes, you're off the air immediately and find yourself in court. Oh, right, said Thomas, accepting the letter. Then he laughed to himself as if enjoying some private joke. Why are you doing that? This may be a calamity, Cobb, but I do not see a reason why it should also be serious. Cobb regarded him warily. Oh, great, you've only gone and lost it. The dappled sunshine of a slippery spring spread its noontime benevolence across pavements and parks, rooftops and sparrows, cabs and cabbages, until the thoroughfares and public spaces of the grey old town sparkled and burned off their spent carpet of dewdrops. In this steaming light and a jaunty mood, Thomas smiled at a rainbow and contributed a rare something toward the burden of a homeless man's maintenance. Waking from a pleasant amble of daydream thought, never too far away from a certain someone special, he raised his eyes to a monolithic building and wondered for a moment what on earth he was supposed to be doing here. The county court seemed a lovely old historical place to Thomas. Bitter, twisted, a knackered Regency building with an architectural extravagance that you don't see today because people don't like them. Its ivy-scaled facade and heavy, intimidating steps which ran up the front past a carving of Siphus put visitors under immediate pressure to break down and admit to everything, even when only there to deliver the milk. Ah, respect, the common word for fear. In fact, the architect was so good, the story went that most of his labourers were transported to Australia on general principles long before it could be finished. Thomas had never been in the justice system before, although he did have a wayward cousin who once made a drainpipe periscope and leant over the windowsill of his flat to peek through the window upstairs. His defence had been that he wanted to see if they were normal. He fell down the stairs back in 94. It wasn't long before Cobb headed in to complete the line-up image on the wanted poster. Thomas managed a whispered aside. I've been eating vegetables in the morning. What the hell is wrong with me? Before Cobb could reply, Bryn closed on them like a fry gate from a tree-lined path that ran around the back of the building, a place where the finest legal minds of five generations had hidden breaks to demolish their cheese and onion sarnies. Are you okay, Cobb? I... I don't know. About getting sued? My lead weights feel like limbs. Thomas wasn't listening. He was tuned into a different melody as a light slaped over Bryn's left shoulder and post-boxed her eyes in the manner recommended by early cinematographers. Bryn wasn't feeling her usual self either. He may be an idiot, she thought, but he's a very well-educated idiot. A movie played out of focus and her hazel eyes looked bigger now. A jig of colours and he was about to fall into them, like a hockney when the reverie was broken. As if by magic, the solicitor appeared, popping out from behind a Doric column. Hauling Team Wengley inside, he would have preferred to do so by their collars, drawing lines through all the standard defences. The lawyer resolved not to appear so much for the defendants as for the fee. A winning team? Hardly. Two fools up for contractual fraud and their expert witness. He literally didn't speak their language. If you attempt to run away, the solicitor informed them, you will be treated as felons, enemies of the crown. Why would an object dart have enemies? wondered Thomas. It's an English concept. The gallery thronged like a cockfight, which hadn't happened since the mass adultery case of 1864, a false accusation scandal cynically designed to draw attention away from the clotted cream taxes that had so angered the valleys. Whippings ensued. Much of the crowd revealed themselves to be fellow students by their faculty scarves and their rowdy demeanour. Two held aloft a cardboard sign which read, We speak Wenglish, and beneath, Gitty ta stoddy gok Wengli, you tarty sods. All rise, this court is now in session. The judge wandered in as if they owned the place, sat down and told everyone to be seated. Despite support, the case itself was soon progressing inexorably against the defendants. Quite a lot happened next, but to save you wandering off, we shall only tune into the important bits. Thomas took the stand, and luckily found that there were already gouges in the wood which perfectly fitted his fingernails. I put it to you that this language was not spoken historically. You're right there, I grant you that. You're a sharp one, Thomas conceded. The prosecutor flinched at this unusually helpful reply, saving him several hours of technical analysis. He began to like this defendant on a human level, but would have to overcome that impulse for now and go for the throat. Your fraud is revealed. What do you expect will happen next? Now everyone can see you are incompetent and talentless. Thomas considered his options. I don't know, I'll probably go into teaching. Realistically, he knew he could always work in his cousin's business, 
pumping out ship's lavatory tanks. The poop deck, Port Talbot, Owain Thomas, prop. Yet you plead innocent? You stated in this contract that you would supply training in a spoken language. Ah, yes, responded Thomas. That is something we agreed to do for the television. So you admit, the prosecutor pressed, that you took payment under false pretenses for a service which you could not provide, thus breaching contract. Actually, no, replied Thomas, sheepishly. In the negative sense, no, or did you mean you know? With respect, people have learned the Wangley language, so it has become as real as any other. Bryn and I and my mate Cobb speak it, as do quite a few of the viewers. It is a minority Celtic language, but qualifies, and training was provided. I don't think I'm wrong. Pre-bath former tea did knock that divot, buckle walkers, called a supporter from the gallery. Judicial process was asserted as Heckler was removed to the cold baths without further incident. English is spoken in this court, said the prosecutor. Also Latin and even some French nomenclature on occasion, the judge corrected. Justice is not language specific. The prosecutor hadn't foreseen Thomas's defence and recognised he might have a challenge on his hands after all. The bumpkin wasn't finished. It's the old story of the carrot and the egg, isn't it? I'd usually one thing after another, but sometimes it's the other way round. What about Linear B? Have you heard of Arthur Evans, the local boy who discovered that? The Minon spoke it 3,000 years ago and only left their records in pictograms, so no one speaks it now. The last local language speaker on the Isle of Man died without passing it on, like my grandfather did for his dialect, and that was that. They are still languages, even though no one alive knows them or speaks them today. If those qualify, and our language doesn't, even though we have plenty of living speakers using it, and they have none, I mean, where's the sense? If you only accept truth as it remains static at an arbitrary chosen point in time, you can't question any of the world's truisms. Bodies are at rest, jokes make you laugh, and eating green things is good for you. Some jokes aren't funny. Some green plants and compounds can finish you off. On the date of the contractual agreement, was this language current? Thomas was pressed to answer. On the date of the agreement, we contracted to provide a living language to a television audience, which we have now done to the audience's satisfaction, he said to a resounding cheer from the gallery. Time edged by in a haze of uncharitable questions. Cobb had formed the opinion over the course of the day that the prosecutor wasn't entirely impartial. That's just the judge, Bryn told him. Oh, OK. The sun changed position and a buttercup beam streamed through the window and picked out Cobb's nose. Then so did Cobb. Thomas heard, the judge will now, something, the verdict, before it all became too much and he shamefully fainted. This court is adjourned, announced the bailiff. All rise. What happened? asked Thomas, waking up and slightly spinning. It was amazing. The judge delivered the verdict in our language and then in English. Here you go. I got the judge to sign Bryn's pamphlet for you. Jump like crazy, mate. We won! Thomas's head and Mary goed again until Bryn noticed and ripped him away with a kiss. Let's get ourselves a bungalow. When he'd recovered and they all stepped outside, Thomas shot a sudden smile at Cobb and threw the pamphlet so high in the sky it became a star.